Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Gordon Ritchie. My pronouns are he, him. Karen Mills and I will not only be your service leaders, but we also have the great pleasure of being the conductors of our church choir, Coriolis. It is great to be together here in the sanctuary and online. We are one of two Unitarian Universalist congregations in Edmonton, the other being Westwood Unitarian Congregation on the south side. Our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison, is off today. We welcome her back next Sunday. Uh, this is when we have our little moment of announcements, and I would like to start off by announcing something about announcements. Uh, if you, just a little reminder for everyone, if you do have a church-related announcement, please uh, let the service leader know before the service begins. That would be extremely helpful. Uh, it just creates a lovely a little bit more of a gentler flow for the beginning of the service. Uh, and I know I have two other individuals uh, that are wanting to do announcements. If I can have Alara and Susan come forward. Um, as they're doing so, I know Audrey Brooks would want me to announce this. There is a concert uh, here in our sanctuary this afternoon. It's an interfaith concert at 2 p.m. Uh, it's free admission. Uh, Audrey, I know, has been saying that there are some wonderful musicians that are coming in to perform at this concert. Um, hi, Audrey, we're just talking about you. <laughs> so that's 2 p.m. Uh, here in the sanctuary, and all are welcome to attend. And here's Alara. Hello, friends. I'm Alara. My pronouns are they and them. I am announcing, I'm sure many of you are already aware, but there is a protest for the bill that was proposed by Danielle Smith last week that are putting trans youth at risk in many, many ways and equating us with some of the far right leaning places in the states, which we don't want. Uh, so the protest is at noon at the legislature grounds, and as well, I have access to all of the petition letters to MLAs. So if anybody is interested in that, I have the links. I can send them to you directly. It takes about 40 seconds to sign. So come to me after the service if you would like links. I am the secretary of the board, and I just want to formally invite everybody to an emergency media, meeting or a congregation which will happen after church next Sunday the 11th, about 11.45, and it will be on Zoom and in person. And the purpose of this is to talk about funding of uh, our roof problems and how to go forward with that and Andrew will be leading that discussion. And one more announcement regarding Friday is for Food and Fun, which is coming up on February 16th. That's being hosted by Reverend Rosemary and Tanya Vandenberg. Robert and I attended the last one, which was in November, and it was so much fun. Uh, Reverend Rosemary created this absolutely fantastic spaghetti dinner, and then there was singing, some really quite fantastic singing. So you're welcome to come. It is um, free of charge, so you can come and have a fantastic meal. Uh, you can sing later for karaoke or listen. Um, Robert and I actually brought a salad with us. Don't tell Reverend Rosemary this, but we brought a salad to share. You don't need to, um, but you're more than welcome if you so desire, but everything is all taken care of. So that's on the 16th, beginning at 5.30 here at the church. Our theme for the month of February is equity and justice. Our service this morning was created by Karen Mills. She wrote the following description about this service. If we let rationalization replace justice, resignation replace equity, or pity replace compassion, our human relations are diminished. These words by Michael Deschlein will serve as the core of our service. Through words, music, and reflection, we will explore what is needed and the tools we have to build a more just and equitable world. And let us also remember the land on which we stand, worship, play, 
enjoy our lives. It is Treaty 6 territory. A Treaty 6 is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. And so as we begin our time together, I would invite you to settle yourself, quiet yourself, but also quiet any electronic devices that you may have with you this morning. Thank you. And so may we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but are connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to one another. And so let's, let us begin our service with a prelude. Good morning, everyone. Our op <laughs> I know, you already did that. You're tired out. Our opening words today are by Elizabeth Strong. Today, we celebrate a dream awakening. Today, we worship a renewed hope in our hearts. Today, we act on an audacity of hopes and dreams for the future. Today, we begin the hard work of justice, equity, and compassion in all human relations. For today is a day like no other, and it's ours to shape with vision and action. Let us worship together and celebrate a dream awakening. I'll invite Declan Kylie to come forward and light our chalice. And as he does that, I'm going to read words by Deborah Falk. Deborah uh, was most recently the minister in Calgary. She just retired uh, this summer. And she writes, A chalice lit in our midst is a symbol of our liberal faith. A faith built on the foundation of freedom, reason, and tolerance. A faith sustained by kindness and justice. A faith that visions a world flourishing with equality for all her people a faith that demands living out of goodness, a faith that requires thoughtfulness, a faith of wholeness. A tiny flame is the symbol of the spark of all this within each of us. Thanks, Declan. Oh, 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 oh,
Acceptance of one another. Oh. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay. We believe in acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregation. How do I withhold acceptance? Do my fears stunt our congregation's growth? When next I hesitate, can I extend my hand instead? We believe in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. How much more will we learn if we share our search with travelers who set a different pace, see from a different perspective, or understand with a different wisdom? We believe in the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process 
within the congregation and in society at large. For all to have a voice, we need many ways of expression and we need many ways to listen. We believe in the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Just as peace means no violence, and liberty means no oppression, and justice means no prejudice, all means no exceptions. We believe in respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. We gain strength from the support of others, and we grow stronger as we support others. We believe in individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion in ourselves and in our institutions. We experience the power and joy of true community when each of us and every institution is open to all. Let us say together, together we can weave our values into an even stronger web of existence. And for anyone who's new to Unitarian Universalism, the congregational lines are actually the principles of Unitarian Universalism. All right, we would now have another hymn. It's number 1017 in your blue book or on the words on the screen behind me, Building a New Way. The next reading is entitled, The Miseducation of Justice Making by Nathan C. Walker. And I, I have to comment that uh, whether you're thinking about Myanmar or the Middle East, or if you're thinking about the province, our own province this week, I have to say this is a really timely passage. <clears throat> what does justice making look like, feel like, when we receive hostile communication? Are we hostile in return? or is so, or is something else required of us? What we choose to do is a reflection of who we believe ourselves to be. It all depends on what kind of power we value. I once, it, I once believed it to be powerful to condemn wrongdoers. I believed it right to tear down another's unexamined assumptions and vaporize those whose presence was not worthy of my attention. I've spent far too much energy using the public forum as a battlefield. I've spent far too much energy using the public forum to annihilate those perceived to be my enemy. I believe that others were the cause of my aggression. Others were to blame for my feelings of despair, disappointment, and righteous indignation. I used to believe that being feared was powerful. I used to believe that it was my duty to, be, to free the oppressed. But when reacting with righteous anger, Guess who becomes the oppressor? So come, lovers of justice and keepers of dreams, 
Come, tyrants and suppressors of screams, you are all welcome here. None of us are exempt. We've all played the parts, the peacemaker, the warmonger. They live within. This is why we, as seekers of freedom, are required to make justice not simply a product, but a process. Just actions are the means to achieve a justice society. When we observe oppression, let us develop strategies that free not only the oppressed, but also the oppressor. Let us remember that those who use their power to deny freedom to others are also imprisoned and are worthy of care. Do not let their unjust actions inspire us to justify employing cruel means, or else we'll soon become what we are set out against. The challenge is this. Let us take up the miseducation of justice making by stripping our conscience of images of equity that claim to manifest through condemnation, through humiliation, through shame and blame, and righteous vindication. No. The craft of justice making begins by marrying a just thought with insightful words, inspiring us to collective action, daring to free both the oppressed and the oppressor, for we know what it's like to be both. Don't get me wrong, stand we must, stand strong and bold, but let us choose a new way to balance the scales. Rather than shoving our foot on the oppressor's neck, let us reach out a hand, offer a gift, and show them, and even ourselves, a new way of justice making. I was so happy when I found that reading, um, because A, it made me grateful that there are such smart and thoughtful people in the world, but it so perfectly aligns with this message that has just been coming to me over and over and over again for about the last year in all sorts of different ways. And so that's what I want to share with you this morning. And it's, um, well, I'll just start in with it. Uh, when Gordon and I were pulling together materials for this service, I came across a reading that really spoke to me, not only that one, but another one called The Deep Unity of Human Family. It's by a UU minister in Arlington, Virginia, named Amanda Papai. And she wrote, humanism is primarily about who we are connected to, what we think about each other, and how we work for justice in the world. No matter what else they believe, humanists insist on the inherent worth and dignity of every person. According to humanists, we are all part of one human family and are connected to the rest of the natural world, part of a cosmic story far bigger than we can imagine. Humanists believe that we're in that story together and that our work is to write our chapter with as much love and dignity as we can. In the humanist view, change will happen in our world because we make it happen, and that change will take all of us. She goes on to say, I'm no longer interested in perpetuating the old paradigm of the humanist-theist divide. I never have liked polarities and dualities. They lead to all kinds of misconceptions. And this one is no exception. The humanists are old and stuffy and intellectual, one stereotype goes. They prefer debate to emotion, and they don't like to sing. Really, they're practically secularists, and who knows why they even come to church anyways. The theists, on the other hand, are leading us down a, toward evangelical Christianity, says another stereotype, and all they care about is sneaking prayer into every service. If they have their way, soon there won't be any difference between us and Presbyterians. Polarities breed stereotypes, and stereotypes are always oversimplified and usually pretty boring. On a practical level, she says, the stereotypes and more importantly, the whole idea of the humanist theist polarity keeps you use squabbling with each other rather than focusing on the real needs and challenges of the world. It holds us back, ironically, from living out the full promise of humanism, which is to honor both the real and important diversity and deep unity of the human family and to create a world where the whole family flourishes. What if 
instead of imagining humanism as one end of a seesaw, we saw it as a possibility that is open to all regardless of their metaphysical beliefs. That's the lived reality of deed before creed, the organizing idea behind Unitarianism. In 1866, James Freeman Clark, a Unitarian minister and an early organizer of the American Unitarian Association wrote, we think it is possible to have a church and even a denomination organized not on a creed, but on a purpose of working together. Suppose that the condition of membership was the desire and intention of getting good and doing good. That's where her piece ends. That reading caught my attention for two reasons. First, it pulled me back to memories of when I first began attending UCE. We were at another building close to here. And I started coming in 1991, and yes, I am that old. Um, at the time, there was a core, and I might even say the majority, it felt like to me, of the congregation that very proudly labeled themselves humanists. They were kind, loyal, curious, dedicated people who worked hard to support the church and create a more fair and just world. But at the same time, their strong views on the support uh, the superiority of humanism, coupled with a very vocal disdain of God language, made little room for anyone who held different beliefs, was exploring a different path, or had positive associations with a Christian upbringing. And many of these folks shared that they came to humanism and ultimately Unitarianism because they felt so excluded in the Christian-centric world that they were surrounded by. However, in practice, their own label seemed to work against their desire to build the more inclusive, understanding world they wanted to be part of. The second reason Amanda's message really struck a chord with me is that it closely aligns to the words of a woman I have just discovered in the last year um, who has really made me think a lot. Uh, Irshad Manji is a queer Muslim woman who has risen to recognition because of her calls to reform her Islamic faith and to bring less polarizing and more reasoned conversation into the world. Uh, in short, she says she wants to, make, to end the us versus them mindset. I heard her name a while ago, but hadn't really paid much attention. Um, and that changed, though, when I got the opportunity to hear her speak. The Edmonton Public Library brought, brought her in as one of their forward-thinking speaker series last year. She shared that her life's work started at a very young age. She grew up in a violent household, and so she saw her way out and her way to be better than that was education. And so she committed to having a really good education, and to her, that meant thinking for herself. And she took that very much to heart because when she was 14, she got expelled from her Islamic school for asking too many questions. Later, studying Islam on her own, she discovered that it is possible to reconcile faith and freedom, a freedom of thought. Uh, that was a concept that she had not encountered before. And the discovery led her to write two internationally best-selling books calling for a reform of Islam. What really grabbed me at her talk, though, was how her personal approach to her mission changed through the years and how that completely changed the response that she received. So her first book she wrote as a response to 9-11. Um, and so, as you can recall, most, some of you can recall, emotions everywhere were really, really high. Um, you know, to say that you were Muslim was really a publicly charged thing to do. And then to be a Muslim and call for reform to Islam was very, very charged. Um, she followed that up with a second book calling for people to ditch dogma while keeping their faith. In both cases, um, both books were met in the uh, Muslim world with hatred, protests. She was attacked at her book launches. Um, they had to have extra security. She was living in Toronto at the time. They put bulletproof glass all through her house and she had 24 hour security because of the death threats. And both books are still banned in many Muslim countries. But she saw herself as what she labeled a cultural warrior. 
And so she said, I took the approach of what I had always seen, that if somebody strikes out at you, you strike back harder, sooner, and in a more prolonged way. And so she did that. She tried to shame her, what she saw as others, her enemies. She publicly ridiculed those who held beliefs that were different from her. Um, and she did that for 10 years. And she got to the point where she had written a third book and was about to go on the book launch tour. By this time, she had become a very prominent person, and she got a morning interview on uh, a national uh, US uh, talk show that held the biggest audience for morning talk shows, and she thought, this, this is it, I've arrived. And so she was prepared, and she was, you know, her adrenaline was up, and she was ready to go. And she said she was sitting in the uh, chair getting her hair done for the show, and this little voice came to her and said, this, is this really the best place for your message? And she said to her little voice, she said, I'm just nervous. This is just nerves. This, that's all it is. It's, it's, this, is, this is the biggest invitation I've ever had in my life. I have to keep going. And she uh, then got into the makeup chair, and this little voice said, what do you think would happen if you didn't do this interview? They'd probably go to a commercial break. They'd find something else to talk about. The other guest would get a little more time. Nobody would really care. And at that moment, she blacked out, fell to the floor, and had to be taken by hospital, to, to the hospital by ambulance. Ten years of being a cultural warrior had completely exhausted her mentally, physically, and spiritually. And her two doctors said to her, Either you change what you're doing, or you find new doctors. And she said, I'm embarrassed to say this now, but I actually had to think about that choice. So she took the summer, and she thought about that choice. And she said at first she was angry, and she saw that all her hard work had kind of added up to what she felt like was nothing. And then when that subsided, she was able to step back and look and see that the way that she had approached her work by shaming others and publicly ridiculing them and being so angry and so sure that she was right and had all the answers, not only isolated people who had already held different beliefs, but it had actually started to shake the faith of people who had initially supported her. And so people who were her early allies had started to question is this really about changing beliefs, or is it about her being in the spotlight? And she said when she realized that, she knew something had to really change. And so she went back to her commitment to education, and she started to learn everything that she could learn about neuroscience and neurobiology. And she made some discoveries about the brain, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but she decided that she needed a whole new approach, and that she had to make a way for there to be conversation and shared understanding and room for people to grow and change and learn from each other and to actually have a conversation instead of a yelling match. And so she came up with some points and some ways that she wanted to be and some ways of opening conversations that she thought would be really good. And then, um, then she got a real test. Al Jazeera phoned her and said, we'd like you to come on this show, a debate program called Head to Head, so you can imagine how friendly that would be. Um, and there's going to be this very well-known imam, and we would like you to be the other voice on speaking, and um, see how that, how that works for you. And she thought, well, I have to try this out sooner or later. It sounds really good in my head, but I'm not going to know until I really use it in a conversation. And so she went on the show, and she said she was very, very nervous, which she had never been before, because when you're so sure you're right, you, you know which path you're going to go down. She said when she went in as a listener with the possibility that she might be wrong in some ways, that she might actually learn something from this person who seemed to have very different views, it made her really scared. 
So she went through the show. She tried out her techniques that we'll talk about and was actually pretty pleased with the fact that they had a conversation, that it didn't turn into a yelling match. She said the producers were not pleased with that because it was not good TV. But she, she was quite fine. But at the end of the show, she was just really drained. And so she left the studio immediately. But she knew that she had to go to a reception after. And so she went into the reception and she was going to get something to eat. And from the corner of her eye, she saw this group of imams in the corner. And it was a group that she had publicly fought with before. And she thought, oh, here we go. And the imam came over and she thought, I'm going to commit to this new way. I'm, I'm not going to provoke anything. I'm just going to listen. And he said, you know, we agree with just about everything you said. And she just about fell over. And she said, well, but I've been saying this for the last 10 years. What, what was different today that you didn't hear, you know, in the last decade? And he said, humility and a willingness to listen. And from there, it turned out that they brought her in to all of their worship services to actually do workshops with their congregations because their congregations were feeling so polarized in, in dialogues that they were trying to have in the community. And so she ended up doing, I think she said 12 different workshops for these Islamic congregations. Um, so it seemed to work. From all that work, she developed what is now called the Moral Courage College. And it's online and in person. They do workshops and teachings right from kindergarten to corporate boardrooms. And their goal is to teach people to turn contentious issues into constructive conversations. And she said, you know, one of the reasons for this is that more and more schools are teaching young people how not to be offensive, but they also need to be teaching a new generation how not to be offended. Uh, and that really struck me, because it's something we've been talking a lot about, um, just in different groups that I'm in, is that, you know, if you are immediately offended and shut down, um, you don't have that chance to have dialogue. And so I, I want to share, because her words are so perfect, I think, uh, what she wrote about why she created the Moral, College, Moral Courage College. She says, according to conventional wisdom, moral courage means speaking truth to power. It's the definition I adopted when writing my first book about the need to reform my religion, and it's the definition the New York University embraced when its leadership invited me to teach moral courage at New York University's School of Public Service. Feeling validated, I didn't question my truth to power mandate when I began as a professor of leadership. But soon enough, two questions revealed themselves to me. First, whose truth? There's fact, and then there's truth. Facts alone can't constitute truth. How one interprets those facts contributes as much to one's understanding of truth as the facts themselves do. After all, as a reform-minded Muslim, I can read the same words of scripture that a traditional believer does and walk away with a completely different interpretation of what those words mean. Similarly, two children can grow up in the same family, experience the same joys, the same trials and tribulations, take part in the same dinner table conversations, but have divergent, even clashing interpretations of their home life. Hence, the first problem with the standard definition of moral courage, speaking truth, implies that truth is crystal clear. The second question that jumped out at me relates directly to the first. In speaking truth to power, whose power must the truth teller confront? Pop culture pushes the narrative that the real power exists only out there. It's in the tech titans, it's with the media moguls, the corporate captains, the police, the protesters, the politicians, the system. In reality, there's more to the picture. A few years into teaching moral courage, I expanded my research in the behavioral sciences, and that's when I realized something pivotal. Every individual who's born with a brain has a form of power called the ego. Not only is the ego pervasive, all of us have one, but if we're unaware of its potency, the e ego easily curdles into a pernicious power, more pernicious perhaps than any external force that we perceive to be holding us back. Let me clarify that I'm not 
intending to be self-helpy or mystical by using the word ego, I'm referring to it in the neurobiological sense. The ego is a function of the primitive part of our brain. It exists to keep us alive. In life and death situations, my stressed out ego will sound the alarm that I'd better prepare to flight or flee. My ego has the power to save my skin. The problem is that the ego is, can't really easily distinguish between mortal danger and mere discomfort. So that means that when my truth is being tested by somebody else's, the more discomfort I feel, at, at, I will be interrupted by my ego telling me it's mortal danger. It's a cognitive illusion, of course. In most contexts, being disagreed with won't kill me. But because the ego's job is to ensure my survival, it will do all it can to manipulate me into believing that I'm under attack and that I've got to lash out or shut down. Which is exactly what the majority of my students did when they encountered a view of, that persistently contradicted theirs. Defensiveness, anger, hostility tended to hijack their stated values of fairness, compassion, and dignity. In such moments, they didn't respond. They reacted. Instead of listening, they resorted to labeling. Conversations congealed into confrontations. As I witnessed this behavior again and again, the metaphor metaphorical light bulb finally flashed for me. Moral courage may very well mean speaking truth to power, but the power isn't exclusively someone else's. I have to speak the truth to my own power, the power of my ego. More of us must. Otherwise, we'll drown in manufactured dogma and mutual disgust. We'll persist in scorning our critics when it's just as likely that the way we've chosen to communicate is itself a barrier to being understood. In short, my adversary isn't always just the person I'm dis who's disagreeing with me. My first and foremost adversary is my own ego. Only by taming it will I be open to finding common ground with the other side, and only then will the possibilities emerge for a co-created future, one that's sustainable because it has buy-in. In her talk at the library, she outlined five steps that she always takes when she's going into any conversation that she feels is polarized or where people have very different points of view. The first step, she says, is to breathe deeply. And she said, well, that's not you know, some hippy-dippy thing of getting centered. She said it's actually, again, neurobiological, that when you breathe deeply, it signals your brain that a transition's in place. It also gives your brain the oxygen it needs to move out of the primitive kind of lizard brain, the amygdala at the back, and into the prefrontal cortex where rational thought and reasoning can happen. She said the next thing she does is she opens every conversation proactively creating common ground. She said a lot of times we hope that through dialogue we'll find common ground. She said, why not just start there? And she has some wording that I really love. She said she starts out every conversation saying, I think we have different views on this subject, and I'm really glad that we're getting to talk about them. And I also know that you are more than this issue. I know that you have different feelings. I know that you have more in your life. I know that you care. Can you please remember the same about me? Which I think sets a whole different ground for a conversation. Then she says, I ask a sincere question. Which is, it has to be sincere. And I do that before I'm stating where I'm coming from because that signals that I'm open to listening, that I want to learn. And it also models that this is going to be an inquiry, not an inquisition. She said, then I try really hard to listen to learn, not to listen to win. And she said, I've, you know, through the years found I can catch myself because if I'm listening to win, I'm listening to see where I can shoot down their points as they come up. Or you know, how silly something is that they've said, or starting to make derogatory comments. And while I'm busy thinking that, I've missed the last, you know, half a minute of their talk, where she said, if I'm listening to learn, I'm suspending judgment, 
I'm listening, I'm giving them the time and the room to actually complete their thoughts, sometimes to work out their thoughts out loud for themselves, and then, then to think about them and respond. The final thing she said is ask another question. And that question is, tell me more. And this was really interesting. She said, um, she started this, it was actually percolated by uh, social media responses that she was getting. And she said, social media has really not helped um, bringing people together and creating common ground. And she would get these really vitriolic comments on social media. And so rather than just letting them go, she would contact the person and say, I'd really like to have a conversation with you. Can we set up a phone call, a Zoom call, if they were in the same city? Can we meet for coffee? And if people took her up on that offer, she would go through all of these steps. And then when they got you know, to a, a point or in the midst of their discussion, she would, she would say, tell me more about this. And she said, nine times out of 10, what I found is that people were not so entrenched in these really polarized, vitriolic ideas, but they had become so scared of being shot down and publicly shamed that they kind of adopted this mantra of do unto others before they do unto you. And so giving that space allowed people to really settle into more of their own ideas, be more authentic, and bring down the tone of the conversation a little bit. And she said, those are great five steps for every conversation. And she said, but I forgot one. There's one question that you have to ask before you even think about having any conversation. And she said, it's probably the most uncomfortable question, but it is the ultimate question. And that is, what am I in it for? Do I really want to solve the problem? Do I really want to create connection? Or do I want to be right and win? And she said, if it's the latter, don't go. Don't start the conversation. Because it won't be a conversation. It will be one-sided. She summed up her talk by saying that using the moral courage approach, you can outwit outwit the ego's either-or frame, which is born by fear, by deliberately adopting the both-and lens. So just like uh, improv in comedy. You know, keep, keep the conversation going by saying and. So it's entirely possible to both stand your ground and seek common ground. Standing your ground is about what you believe. Seeking common ground is about how you express what you believe. When you communicate with the intent to understand, not conquer your other, you'll override the ego's need to win at all costs. You'll forge the relationships to hear and be heard. You'll be reconciling free speech and social justice. You'll have outsmarted the mental prison fabricated by fear. I took a lot away from her talk. I've read her books. Um, And what it's really melted down to for me is that social justice and equity has to start within me. That it requires me to change myself before I can ask change in others. But I also believe that for social justice and equity to really take hold, they can't come from a place of revenge for the past actions, but they have to come from a place of hope for the future and the potential that I see in every person to grow and to change and to add to the richness of the world. And this this all takes me back to the words of James Freeman Clark. We think it is possible to have a church and even a denomination, and I would add a world, organized not on a creed but on a purpose of working together. Suppose that the condition of membership was the desire and intention of getting good and doing good. I'd like to close us out with some words by Laura Ludwig called What We Do Matters. Spirit of life and love, we're here because we believe what we do matters. We are here because we believe how we live our life matters. That with every act of kindness or meanness, courage or fear, love or hate, 
We are weaving the fabric of the universe that holds us all. We're here because none of us is perfect, but together we inspire one another to try again, to take one more step. We are here because we have all felt the stirrings of love and grace in our hearts and hands, and we crave more of that. For ourselves, and not only for ourselves, for everyone. We are here now because how we live matters. Amen and blessed be. Please join, you can stay seated, but please join in singing hymn number 168, One More Step. I invite you now into a time of meditation. Feel free to relax into your chair or your bed or on the floor, wherever you are. Take a couple deep breaths, and I'm going to invite Alec Morgi to read some meditation words. Meditation on Hope and Love in a Time of Struggle by Alice Anacheka Nasman. <clears throat> in a world so filled with brokenness and sorrow, it would be easy to lose ourselves in never-ending grief, to be choked by our outrage, to be paralyzed by the enormity of suffering, to feel our hearts squeeze tight with hopelessness. Instead, this morning, let us simply breathe together as we hold our hearts open. Breathing in as our hearts fill with compassion. Breathing out as we pray for healing in our world and in our lives. Breathing in, opening ourselves to the transforming power of love breathing out as we pray for peace in our world and our lives, breathing in as we hold hope in our hearts, and breathing out as we pray for justice in our world and our lives. May we know our strength. May we be filled with courage. May our love flow from us into this world. Breathing in, we are the prayer Breathing out, we are the healing. Breathing in, we are the love. Breathing out, we are the peace. Breathing in, we are the hope. Breathing out, we are the justice. May we know our strength. May we be filled with courage. May our love flow from us 
into this world. Amen. Blessed be. May it ever be so. And so let us take a moment to acknowledge all that is going on in our lives, the lives of our community, the lives of our planet, those on the planet. We light candles to acknowledge these struggles, these challenges, but also the joys, the celebrations in our lives and those we know. For those of you who are online, if you wish, I invite you to write your thoughts, your prayers, your wishes, your concerns, your joys into the chat. For those of you here in the sanctuary in a moment, I'll invite you forward to light a candle. And I would ask that you come over on my left, tapers are here, and light our candles in the center. Before we do so, I have a reading for you by D. Scott Cooper. <coughs> there is a glow, <coughs> excuse me, there is a glow far off in the distance, a light to which no path leads. We know that each time we help another or join with them to heal the world, each time we stand up for justice and what is right, each time we work for hope and love against all odds, a spark is created and adds to the intensity of that light. We join with others who seek and turn towards that glow. As we travel towards that beacon, the underbrush of indifference is flattened and a path is created. More are led to join us and obstacles are kicked away and a road is formed. Many approach the light, strengthened by our work, and we join them to each light a candle we travel out into the world again to light the darkness and begin again. The cycle continues as our work intensifies the glow. We continue knowing that one day we or our grandchildren or perhaps their grandchildren will no longer travel that widened and trodden path with a candle because dawn has arrived. Justice and commonplace and poverty is vanquished and the beloved community stands illuminated in the fullness of daylight. If you wish to light a candle, I invite you forward now. Come over this side if you wish.
Isn't humming a wonderful thing? <laughs> Warms my heart. I'm going to ask Karen to light a very special candle for us this morning. This past January, Coriolis lost one of our members. Lucille Hollins passed away on January 26th. I asked Karen to light a candle to her memory and for those who grieve her loss. She will be missed. Thank you, Karen. I offer these words by Eric Walker Wickstrom. Spirit of life, known by many names and yet by no name fully known, we gather today with hopes and dreams and also with fears and wounds. May we be reminded that all things come and go, that today's joys and tomorrow's sorrows will in time give away to those of tomorrow, and that those of us who have strength to share today ought to do so while we can, and that those who are in need ought to allow ourselves to receive. For tomorrow, those roles might well be reversed. Spirit of life, mother and father of all, help us to remember those who are not here with us today, those who need what we have found here, and those who have what we here need. May we always be open to growth and change, to movement, to grace, in the name of all that is holy and in all the holy names that have ever been uttered and those that have not yet even been imagined, let us say, blessed be, shalom, and amen. Our next hymn is something a little different. It's a participate as you would like or not. Uh, it's actually a video, and so I'll ask our techs if uh, they can stop recording right now because it is copyrighted. So for people who are watching online, I would encourage you to go to YouTube and find it. It's through a UN organization or affiliated organization called Playing for Change. Is uh, Playing for Change They've got, like I said, a whole bunch of tunes, but that one's called A Better Place. So you can sing along at home anytime you like. Right now, we're going to do our bit here to make the world a better place and share our abundance. And so um, I'd invite the ushers to take the collection as I talk a little bit about who we are supporting. We are a solely self-sufficient church, and uh, so we, as we heard needing a congregational emergency meeting, really have to support ourselves and this month that takes on a little bit of an extra uh, feel with some uh, leaking roofs but we also offer half of our unidentified contributions to a, a group outside of our doors and for the month of February that's going to be iHuman. iHuman works with youth and young adults through arts-based programming to help them deal with some difficult challenges that they found in their lives to be able to express what's inside when maybe words are hard for that, and to build their confidence, their strengths, their skills, and just their chances for a better life. Ushers, come on forward and do your thing. Um, so half of the unidentified contribution will go towards iHuman for this month. The other offerings will go towards the supporting the church. You may notice that um, there are people who choose not to put in the collection plate. Many of our members donate through auto, auto debit um, or once yearly or once monthly contribution. Uh, whatever your spirit is feeling like offering this morning is just fine.
I invite you to join in singing from you I receive. The words will be on the screen. invite Declan forward to extinguish our flame, please. And as he does, I will read the words from Israel Bufardi. The road that lies ahead of us is a long one, and the pace of progress will sometimes feel glacially slow. Never forget that glaciers over time can carve out grand canyons and great lakes. Moving tectonic plates can rise up mountains over millennia, or they can explode awe-inspiring volcanoes in milliseconds. Or our commitment to love and justice can do the same. We have closing words from Maureen Killerin. We have a postlude for you, and then we'll invite you to rise, join in a circle, or connect as you like, and we'll sing uh, Carry the Flame. No matter how weak or frightened we may feel, we each have gifts that can make a difference in the world. In this coming week, may you do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger, to celebrate what is worthy, to do the work of justice and love. Be strong, be connected, and each day act so you may be a little more whole.